So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, this is the usual after the uh, uh, conference dinners and the first session morning in the morning. So, but uh, I think people are gathering slowly. Okay, so we'll continue the uh, uh, disc sessions. And my name is Motohide Tamura from the University of Tokyo. And uh, our first speaker is Sylvie Calvert, and she's talking about a jet and outflow from star to cloud. Yes, so uh, I'm going to present you um, just a quick overview of what's going to be in that chapter, uh, which is covering uh, actually jets and outflows from star to cloud. So it's a lot of scales that I'm going to try to cover here. And uh, I've had, um, uh, we are a number of people who are listed here, uh, a large team, um, because to, to cover all these scales and all the, the processes there uh, requires a lot of different expertise that none of us could do uh, alone. Um, and so uh, I'll just start with a few introductory slides just for the people who uh, are n more work not working on jets. Uh, what, 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 where do we see jets and why do we matter? So first we see them uh, actually in all kinds of accreting uh, young sources from the youngest class zero protostars all the way to the class two stars that just have disks left around them. And uh, notice that they're more spectacular in the early phases and also larger. They appear larger uh, and they shrink as time goes, which is a bit you know, counterintuitive. Uh, but that's just because they, the, the accretion rate drops dramatically across time. And so the, the brightness of the jet also drops. And in the end, these move out of the cloud and you're just left with the, you can only detect these innermost regions. Uh, the interesting, uh, very important thing to realize is that, so this is a universal uh, phenomenon across not only evo so evolutionary stages, it's also uh, correlated with the accretion power, um, and that, that has been uh, demonstrated and, and, and uh, both in class twos, class ones, and class zero stars. And it's universal in mass. Uh, jets have been found now around brown dwarfs and also around massive stars of up to 10 solar masses. Uh, I have the impression that my uh, solar <laughs> symbols are not going to show up, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, and it's just the jet speed that changes. It increases in the more massive stars, but o other than that, the jet phenomenon seems very robust. And that is already an indication that it's something just intrinsically linked to the accretion process. Uh, so why do they matter? I mean, they're not just beautiful fireworks, but they're also being invoked repeatedly in this conference uh, to solve several major problems of star formation. Uh, the problem of why is the star formation efficiency so low in clouds, I even when uh, magnetic fields are, are fainter than the turbulence. We still see that. Uh, it has been invoked uh, as a feedback mechanism to prevent uh, too much star formation. Also, we know that it seems that the core to star efficiency is rather low. It's only 30% of the mass of the core that ends up in the star. And uh, people have been invoking outflows as a way to explain that. Uh, finally, we've seen also in uh, several chapters that uh, outflows may be the, the, the way out to explain why disks accrete and why stars rotate slowly, young stars. But we, this hasn't been yet demonstrated observationally directly. Um, and then uh, I want to stress that jets may also matter for planet formation and the photoevaporation of disks. Uh, I will have a couple of slides about that. Uh, and also, it's a nice way to get unique information on source, the source structure itself, like binarity, variability, and uh, precession of the, the jet axis, and which may be the disk axis. So um, th there's been remarkable progress on this topic since PP5, and uh, in particular thanks to the, the, the opportunity to have access to the, for the first time to new spatial scales, like uh, very small scales, less than 50 AU, uh, and large scales up to tens of parsecs. Uh, also access to new um, uh, wavelength ranges, including X from the X-ray to down to the submillimeter. Uh, and also proper motion over a time span of more than 10 years. Uh, all of this is giving you a much more complete picture of jets than we had uh, in PP5. Uh, and I'm going to give you a few examples of how this is changing our view of jets. Also, uh, we've progressed thanks to the development of large-scale collaborations uh, through, uh, for example, 
um, a European network called JetSet that Tom Ray was a PI of that was uh, grouping 11 institutes in, in Europe, and uh, more recently the Jetpack collaboration uh, that is um, US and UK partners. And these networks uh, have the specificity that they combine uh, observations, simulations, theory, and a new field of high energy density laboratory experiments called HEDLA that you may uh, hear more in the future. And this talk will also be the opportunity to introduce you to this new emerging field and what we can learn by collaborating with people in that community. Um, so uh, the talk will be divided by scales since we were recovering from basically 0.1 to, to uh, more than 10 parsec. And on the small scale, what we want to know is exactly where do these jets come from? And we've seen um, in, um, in the talk given by Sean Matt that there are several regions that, that can contribute to jets in young stars. There's a stellar wind, there's uh, magnetospheric ejections from the interaction uh, that's generated by reconnections between the stellar f uh, in the stellar field uh, magnetosphere. And then there may be a disk wind if there is a magnetic field in the disk, this can launch airflows. And we have seen in uh, <coughs> Geoffroy's talk that this may actually be uh, a very important to produce accretion, at least in the dead zone. So how do we, uh, how can we progress? And, and also this would have impact on, on planet formation maybe, or planet forming conditions. Um, so what, do we, what have we learned from observations on this topic? First, uh, we have learned thanks to high, you know, sub -arc second resolution that we now can access uh, in the sub-millimeter range with inter uh, interferometers that class zero jets are the s have the same collimation as class two jets. They're indistinguishable in width and the scale where they become collimated. And this was a, a sum of a surprise, but it, it really means that you cannot collimate the jets hydrodynamically by the envelope. Forget about that. There have to, they have to be collimated magnetically by something that doesn't change from, doesn't matter on the envelope. And it has to happen on 50 AU scales, which means it happens on disk scales. So you need a magnetic field in the disk to confine, the, to, to collimate these jets. And this is really a proof that disks are magnetized somehow. And actually, uh, uh, the most efficient way to collimate a wind uh, or a magnetospheric ejections uh, is to have a, an outer MHD disk wind. That's more efficient because in the disk wind you develop uh, toroidal fields that add to the collimation compared to a, the simply poloidal field that you would have if you were, didn't have a disk wind. And this is a demonstration by Meliani et al. of simulation where they actually show that they can collimate uh, very efficiently inner ejections from the central source and the magnetosphere with a disk wind. So that's just an indirect um, evidence, but um, I think it's a very strong, it's a very strong point. <clears throat> uh, now about jet rotation. If jets remove angular momentum from the star and disk system, you expect them to rotate. But how much they rotate depends on where they come from. You know, the angular momentum increases outward in a Keplerian disk. So depending on where you launch the jet from, you expect more or less rotation. And there's been a few, um, I mean, several examples of, of possible rotation signatures, and I'm just showing the, the most spectacular ones here. Uh, the, the first one was in class two, in the class two objects, Digita with HST, and this is just showing, you know, um, velocities asymmetries across the jet beam that are seen with HST. Notice the very small scale here. This is 0.15 arc second. So you really are at the limit of the resolution of the current instruments to, and because Digita's jet is so wide, uh, they managed to see the signature. Um, then in class one, this is a, a very good, uh, very nice observations with Plateau de Bure of CB26 that is also showing uh, rotation signatures, these observations, and this is the model. Uh, and in class zero sources, this is a very spectacular example of a massive class zero source I in the, the Orion uh, BNKL region. Uh, it's launching an outflow on that large scale, but on small scale, you see these this open, up, open out uh, outflow in SIO masers, and they seem to rotate. You see that this side is red and this one is bluer. Uh, and when you do the comparison with the uh, predictions of MHD disk winds, what you'd get is that if this is really rotation uh, due to angular momentum uh, removal, uh, you get launch radii of 0.125 AU, which means that this would have a very strong feedback on its planet formation region. 
Uh, there are still um, some questions about the interpretation in terms of jet rotation, at least in some sources uh, that have puzzling results like at RW or Riga, HH212, and uh, where we find opposite rotation sense between the jet and the disk, or jet and counter jet. Uh, and also variability over a few years. And uh, there are several interpretations to that. Perhaps uh, if you have shocks in an MHD disk wind, this pro can produce counter rotation or can spin up the rotation so it can make variability and, and explain this type of, uh, of puzzling results. Uh, the other explanation is that it's just not rotation, but it's jet precession, orbital motion of the source that producing this, uh, or asymmetric environment that produce these differences in velocity between the two jet sides. And, but what I want to stress here is that anyway, uh, in all of, these, um, all of these puzzling observations are in jets that are really not well resolved across. And there, is, there should be a very strong beam dilution of the rotation signature in these cases. And here I'm showing a um, calculation of the predicted rotation signature for an MHD disk wind. Uh, the pink is the true rotation curve that you would like to observe. And the, the, the solid black lines are what you will actually see depending on your resolution. And you see that even 14 AU, which is 0.1 arc second at the distance of Taurus, is unable to pick up the full rotation curve. You have to go to 5.1 AU, uh, which is much higher resolution than what we have now, to really uh, retrieve the full rotation profile. So currently, you may be domina you're dominated by what's happening on the outer edge of the jet, and that can be perturbed by all kinds of other phenomena. So we, this really needs to be uh, pursued at higher resolution to get the final answer. Um, something that has made a lot of progress recently is um, high angular resolution, not in optical lines because we can't do it, uh, well, except H alpha, but in bracket gamma using interferometers. And what the data have shown is that the size of the bracket gamma line in all the sources investigated, most of them, is larger than what you expect just for a pure magnetosphere, uh, and it's smaller than the continuum in most cases. There's one exception. So uh, you're looking at something that is not just the magnetosphere. And this is actually demonstrated further when you, you do observations that are spectrally resolved across the line, and you, you look at um, displacements between velocity bins, and you find a bipolar distribution. This is beautiful work that was done uh, by Miriam Benisti. So here you have the proof that not only it's resolved, but it's probably a compact outflow. And notice the scale here. Um, and then there's been even um, if you really want to know now what type of airflow you have, you have to go into more detailed modeling and take into account not only the sizes, not only the, sh the displacements, but also the full phase information about how a asymmetric your distribution is. And there's been uh, very little work on this so far because it's so hard, but this beautiful work on, uh, by Weigelt et al. on MLWC297, where uh, they show that they can best fit all of their data with a, a disk wind from roughly 0.5 to 1 AU um, out. So uh, this is some, something that is probably going to explode in the next coming years with new instruments. Um, something else that we had as, as a big surprise in the was that uh, jets emit in X-rays, uh, young stellar jets of you know, low, moderate velocities. And um, well, it was, it, it, the, the interesting point is that you see it from 30 AU to parsec scales. Um, on parsec scales, OK, it's not so surprising when you have fast bow shocks, uh, driving shocks that you, you need shocks of about 500 kilometers per second to reproduce the, the temperatures that are observed. And some HH objects do move that fast. But uh, in, in, in a, an object like Digita, which is much lower a mass and much lower uh, jet speed of about 200 kilometers per second, this was more surprising. Um, and you see, you see emission both uh, along the jet axis. Uh, this is associated with an optical knot. Um, and you see also emission, another emission peak much closer to the source that seems stationary at about 30 AU. Um, so Either this could be due to uh, maybe some hot, tenuous stellar wind that is much faster than what we see in optical lines. It's just something that hasn't been seen before, and you're missing it just before because it's so hot and so tenuous. Uh, or maybe this is a, co a collimation shock uh, near the star, uh, or mag magnetic heating. And notice that this will have also an impact on the, the irradiation of the disk, which is just below, because you're, you're shining onto the disk from above, which is very efficient. And um, 
um, some of the um, some ways uh, now how does this link for example to a high energy density laboratory astrophysics is these beautiful um, laboratory experiments of possible uh, magnet magnetized tower jets so this is a way of launching jets that relies mostly on the toroidal magnetic field uh, and they have managed to set up an apparatus that produces that with wires with a strong current that flows through it uh, they impose a toroidal magnetic field, and as the, the strong current progressively first ablates, um, well, evaporates the wires, create a background plasma, and then, then eventually they snap open, and the current goes through, through this uh, outer shell that is driven out then by the magnetic pressure. And in the middle, this pinches uh, the material and creates an actual axial jet. Uh, which you can see in these experiments. So you produce an axial jet just by hoop stresses, and then you have this magnetic cavity that is blown out by the J-cross B-force. And these are MHD simulations that really help you to understand what's going on in these experiments. And notice that uh, you form a clumpy jet. There is a lot of kink instability there because of the strong B5, but uh, you still keep uh, clumps, you form clumps that still keep moving along the axis. Um, so this is really fascinating. Uh, it's, it, it's quite hard to reproduce in the simulations, but you, you, you're starting to, to capture most of the, of the features. But notice how much more resolution you have in the experiments on the, on the instabilities than what you have in the simulations. Um, and this is a way to produce X-rays uh, in these uh, reconnections that happen in the instabilities. Um, so this is just to now to say that, um, OK, if the impact on planet formation uh, that, that these jets can have. Well, the observations show that there could be some strong X-rays and UV from the collimation shock. Now, if we also have a disk wind to collimate, uh, to collimate the jet, then this disk wind is also going to shield the stellar uh, UV and X-rays. Uh, if, if you have the star here and you have this disk wind, any part of the disk here is going to have to go through all these layers of disk winds. Um, that, that can have a big effect. And here I'm showing the AV uh, as a function of height. So as you move up along one of these streamlines, uh, it's one of you streamline, how much your AV is when you start and how much it drops away. And you see at the base, it can be huge. Uh, even in class two star, uh, you get an AV of 10 magnitudes from here looking down onto the star. And the, another impact is that if you remove angular momentum from, by MHD disk winds, uh, well, we have seen that, uh, I think Geoffroy mentioned, or maybe not, but anyway, th this induces a radial transport uh, at sonic speeds, which is very different from what you expect from, um, from a viscosity. Uh, and that may have a strong effect on the chemistry and also the processing of solids. Uh, these solids are going to be lifted up in the disk wind. Uh, they're going to have maybe recon suffer uh, heating, MHD heating, uh, and maybe also an impact on planet formation, uh, planet, sorry, planet migration, if you have the magnetic fields in the disk, and this remains to be uh, studied further, but there's just, there's just been one paper on this that I know of. But. Um, so now I'm going to go to intermediate scales, uh, which is actually where we have the most observations, <laughs> because that's where easiest, uh, not too big and not too small. Uh, but also, I'm going to show how this uh, links into both the issues of launching uh, and also the issue of how jets can feed back onto the cloud scale. So this is a very important intermediate scale where we learn a lot. Uh, this is just a sketch of what we think happens on those scales. You have the jets. I'll show that they're, they're highly variable and then produce internal working surfaces. And they interact with the envelope uh, through shocks or turbulent entrainment. Um, and I'll also discuss that. And um, first, uh, the issue of core to star efficiency is, um, is something that has been mentioned in several talks. And um, it's been mentioned that you can do this in two ways. The first way is to just eject uh, the mass as it collapses onto the central star. You re-eject part of that into a wind by MHD torques. And the, the collapse simulations show this very nicely. Uh, Chardy and Enbel, uh, Machida and Osokawa, for example. And there's been other, many others. And they've studied this as a function, Charlie has studied it as a function of angle between B and, and rotation, and they find that up to 50 degree angles, you uh, have only half of the mass that ends up onto the star. 
So uh, you, you almost explain this factor of three almost just by uh, the early phases of ejection. Um, that's not complete, it's not a factor of three, it's a factor of two. So maybe the rest of it comes also from the fact that the outflow um, broadens in time, and uh, this, you see this in the simulations, and that may also um, 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 re-expel some envelope material that would otherwise have fallen onto the star. And we do have evidence for interactions, strong interactions between the outflows uh, and the, the surrounding envelopes. Um, actually, we see in all, all of these jet sources, um, they have a wider cavity around them that is explained as a sweeping up of the surrounding material um, by uh, either the jet bow shocks or perhaps some wide angle components. And we see that these cavities open up clearly in times this class zero you see uh, statistically opening angles from 20 to 50 degrees. When you go to class one, they're much broader, uh, 80 to 120 degrees. When you go to early class two, this is an example, it's almost uh, 100, uh, it's more than 130 degrees. Um, and then when you go to late class two, there are a few examples uh, of huge bubbles that are seem pretty much spherical, but there are only a few examples now, right now, so it's, it's not clear how common this is, or if it's inclination. You know, if you're looking at this pole on, it's going to look like that. But, um, but definitely, there is a very clear evidence uh, that uh, these uh, outflows uh, seem to to uh, open up. I mean, the cavities seem to open out in time. Although, notice that most of the opening occurs in the class one stage. Here, you don't expect to be removing a lot of the envelope material because most of it is, is anyway in the mid plane, as you can see in the white uh, in the background image. Uh, so, you would do most of the effect in the class one stage. So, it's not clear if that is enough to affect the final mass of the star. Um, and so, wh what, what is doing this broadening? Um, well, it's been. Um, um, you think that you, you may probably need some kind of wide angle component in addition to your jet, and this is also invoked to explain the larger scale CO cavities that you, dr you drive into the cloud. We've, I've, I've just been showing the base here, but when you look at cloud scales, you see these big CO swept up shells, and this is a new ALMA result superposed onto Spitzer maps that show it very nicely in HH 46, 47. Um, and so far, people have thought in these wi of these wide-angle winds as fast, uh, but that cannot be the case. Now, we know that because we've observed that the, the bow shocks along the jet axis are highly curved. Well, you can see it here, but th they're not roundish. They're, they're just, they're highly peaked forward, which means that as you go away from the axis, the velocities must, must drop quite sharply. And this, is all, this has been actually resolved and seen in a few jets, like, for example, this one, which is Digitao. Uh, this is a centroid map, and you see that the jet is, is faster on the axis than on the edges, and the same is seen on the other side. So uh, that means that, for example, if you had in mind the classical X-wing picture of this wide-angle flow with a constant speed, that doesn't, is not what we're seeing. So you have a drop-off of velocity, and um, we don't know exactly how much momentum there is there yet. But uh, that could come either from a slower disk wind, uh, so as you move out in the disk wind, the radii grow, the launch radii grow, and so the launch speed also uh, decreases. Uh, that could explain this. Or perhaps there is a contribution from the airflow that was launched in the first collapse phase. The people who do simulations uh, like to argue that uh, we're looking at something that was launched early on and that is just making these cavities and then uh, they just keep uh, opening in time uh, as time goes. So this is still something that needs to be settled. But please, I think now we know that these are not fast wide-angle winds, so don't put that in your models anymore, please. <laughs> um, something else we've no learned is that um, these jets have actually multiple, a complex structure with multiple components. Uh, in particular, we've learned, thanks to Spitzer and Herschel, that jets often have both atomic and molecular components. Like, uh, you know, class zero jets that were first observed in, in molecules. Uh, now we've seen that they, they show up in O1. Uh, also other ion, ionic lines like iron two, uh, silicon lines, silicon two lines. And um, we also, s we see that there, there are also warmer components than, than we knew before. For example, water 
uh, here is, is probably warmer than what, what we are seeing at in CO or SIO in the millimeter. And there is also H2 emission that is tracing several hundred kelvins of temperature. And we have the same in atomic jets that class two jets or class one jets, we're finding now, uh, we thought they were purely atomic, we find now molecular counterparts. So jets have a, have a complex structure and part of that could come from shocks uh, in the jet, so that, that could, for example, dissociate the molecules into atoms, or you can reform molecules behind an atomic uh, jet. But that could also mean that we have a range, again, a range of launch radii in the jet. And so depending on where you launch your jet from, it will be atomic or molecular. And uh, at, at the current resolution, you will just, uh, it won't be so easy to distinguish uh, what is coming from. And an important impact is that this means we may have to revisit mass fluxes carefully, uh, whether it's shocks or it's a range of launch radii. You really want to make sure that you're capturing all of the mass flux, and that can change our estimate of outflow power. Um, so one, one way to explain, uh, as I said, one way to explain these multiple components is to say that maybe you have a ran range of, of launch radii, like I showed in the first slide on, on the Small scale, we have three different regions that can contribute to the ejection. Um, and if, if one part of that comes from beyond the sublimation radius in the disk, for example, you're going to have dust grains lifted up into the, into the jet. And that's going to affect the chemistry. And there's, in fact, indirect evidence for uh, dust in jets from the fact that we see depletion in these species in the gas phase in some jets at least close to the star, and then when you move out, uh, the depletion disappears. And this really strongly suggests that you have dust grains that are then destroyed uh, progressively along the jet. And this seems to be stronger, this depletion, as at lower velocities, which would also make sense because this would come from larger radii. Um, and there has been chemical models of, uh, of disk winds to see what would be the observable signatures of such dusty disk winds. Uh, you know, can we, you know, do we overpredict uh, things compared to what is observed? Um, so there was a, a first uh, study just to see if the molecules, uh, you know, do molecules survive when you start to lift them up from the disk magnetically? And in fact, they do. Uh, even though you heat the gas strongly by ambipolar diffusion, uh, the gas moves out so fast that it doesn't have time to completely dissociate, and you end up with a lot of molecules depending on how much screening you have in your disk wind. So the more massive the, the disk wind, the better it works, because you can screen out the UV and X-rays from the central star. But the most um, um, striking result that we got recently, and this is work by uh, my student, Walter Ivar, that is uh, going to be submitted very soon, is that the water lines that you predict are amazingly uh, similar to what you observe in uh, with Herschel Hi-Fi in, in, in YSOs. And the black lines are the observed profiles from a, a, a Christensen et al. Uh, and the red lines are the models. And we didn't tweak too much the models. I mean, we had just a few free parameters. Uh, and we were really surprised to see how nice it fits both the fundamental line, but also the uh, upper levels uh, are reproduced, which means we also have the right uh, excitation conditions. And the, the broad range here of the wings is just due to the fact that you're launching from this range of radii. So of course, the next step here is to, to further test that, not just with spectra, but also but resolved data with ALMA or with um, op adaptive optics from the ground in H2. Um, now on intermediate scales, something else that you gain from the observations is that you have a direct access to the variability of the jets over a range of time scales because you can, at the same time, you can see ejections from recent epochs, but as you move out, you get to uh, earlier and earlier ejections, and what you see is that your jet fragments into shocks, bows, these uh, knots and bows, and I'll stress that these are internal shocks, we see that from the line properties, and that can't be just mass variations, because if you just vary the mass ejection rate, that doesn't produce shocks. It's just, it's going to be denser, but it's not going to produce supersonic velocity differences uh, with what's ahead of it. So for that, you need velocity or angle variations, or both. And we actually see those angle variations. For example, here, this is a nice, very nice example of S-shape, uh, angle uh, S-shape, <laughs> which comes from precession. Uh, and here, this is a much, uh, 
this is a Spitzer image of L1157, where you also see precession, but this is a smaller, this is much smaller scale than what we're looking at here. This is more like uh, 3,000, 6,000 years, uh, as compared to uh, 50,000 years for HH34. And, and, and this is a class zero source that is a class one. So now we're starting to probe, um, to probe these, these phenomena in greater detail. And also, recently, we found a new, well, a different kind of, of angle variation, which is due to orbital motions. If you have two stars that orbit one another, and one of them has a jet, the jet is going to, the base of the jet is going to move like this, and it's going to produce uh, wiggles, but there are mirror symmetric between the two sides. It's not going to be an S shape like this. And it's been found in a, now in two sources, uh, and the, with different time scales. Uh, and from that, you can constrain the binary mass and the separation, which is really nice, because these are uh, embedded sources where it's very hard to do such measurements otherwise. And at least in this case, HH111, uh, this binary could be responsible for the large-scale precession that we observe. Um, so th these precessing jets may be due to secular disk precession induced by binary companions. Um, then the velocity variability, uh, how much velocity changes do you need? And well, when you try to reproduce, uh, this is beautiful, you know, <laughs> uh, Hans Zinnecker is in the room, I, I guess, so this is <laughs> my most beautiful jet. <laughs> uh, well, you see these different scales, it's like a, a hierarchical structure. You see small, uh, tightly spaced knots, and then you see uh, more widely spaced bow shocks. And when you, you try to reproduce that with models, you often come up with three different time scales, roughly, of, of a few years, 100 years, 1,000 years. And the velocity jumps uh, increase as you go to, 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 to larger time scales. And uh, what is interesting is that may, may probe, for example, the short time scales, we don't know what that is, but that might be stellar magnetic cycles. Um, or they could be due to perturbations by companions. And obviously, we want to better understand the link of that with the XOR and FUR bus that we heard uh, previously. And that is still, um, so that th this link has been, has been uh, proposed by, by Bill Reiporth, for example, a long time ago. Um, but um, how, what can, it would be nice to have better statistics to, to make that link more obvious. Anyway, what that means is that uh, jets have a complex structure be because of all these internal shocks. And now I'm going to show you what we've learned from 10 years of, of um, HST observations. Pat Hartigan has done uh, a really great work in uh, putting together uh, high resolution images of these jets uh, over a time span of at least 13 years. And it's showing you things that you would never see just from a snapshot picture. So I have to, replay, to press on it to replay it several times. So um, the interesting thing is you can see that this moves much faster uh, than these edges uh, trail behind. And there is a strong, you will see that there is a strong shear between the head of the jet that is moving here and, and these sides. And you will also see, you will watch here, and you will see a new uh, knot, a new, new shock front that appears right here. So oops, OK. Um, so these, these are amazing phenomena that we're starting to see. Um, and another one that is really interesting is, um, oh, I have to, I have to speed up, uh, is HS34, where um, you're going to, if you watch closely, you're going to see, you're going to see clumps, bright clumps here that are moving in different directions and shocks, lots of shocks that are interacting to produce brighter uh, inner shock regions in here, which are called maxstem by, so you can see how these shock fronts move out, propagate, and you can actually see the cooling behind the shock fronts develop, which is really amazing. So the green, I forgot to say the green is H alpha, and the red is sulfur two, and so these mark the shock front location, and then you can see how, how the gas cools behind that. So this is, these are new data that are, are really um, um, bringing a lot of information about how the, the shock structure. And to interpret that, there's also been a lot of uh, you need now to, to make simulations that are able to, to, to compare with the observations. And this is just to show, um, an, um, does it play around? 
the AMR, AMR simulations by Hansen that actually include non-equilibrium uh, ionization. And uh, they also predict, so the, the colors are the same. You predict H alpha and sulfur 2. And now you can, these are with different magnetic fields on top. So the left case is hydro, and then you increase the magnetic field. And potentially, eventually, you should be able to constrain the magnetic field in jets with a comparisons of oops, observations and uh, simulations. Uh, this is also a field where experiments are, are, are crucial because they can they can really show you uh, <laughs> sorry they can really show you how these uh, complex structure form uh, because they get a, uh, for example they get um, you, you can better control the conditions and you can see how uh, max stems forms are, are at interaction of bow shocks and this can be very important for example to understand what how collimation shocks were close to the star how you can get X-ray emission from from HH objects the shock speed is going to be very different in this case and in that case and just how to interpret all these complex data that we have on, on shock fronts in jets. Now I'm going to turn to large scale and I really have to speed up. Um, so the feedback is, is a very important issue. We've heard about it many, many times so far. And um, this is uh, a nice image of um, outflow maps in a serpent's cluster showing how these outflows are just everywhere and uh, you know, they, they, they certainly do something to star formation in clusters, but what, what do they do is really an important question. And this, I'll go, um, Mark Rummel's chapter already discussed uh, the, the fact that we need, in fact, this alpha feedback to explain, the, to reduce the star formation efficiency, otherwise you produce too many stars, and to sustain turbulence in cluster environments. And here we're going to focus on the processes and the observational connections. How can we, um, how does this work, and how could we test that observationally? Uh, so first thing to note is that uh, these, these outflows, so you first want to see how much momentum you have really in these outflows. And the answer has been changing in time because as you map, okay, as the maps grow bigger, the outflows grow, grow bigger too. Uh, so this is an example of uh, B5 outflow, and the size of the outflow has changed by a factor of two uh, with the size of the map. So this is not surprising in itself, because if, 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 you, if you think that they're moving at 100 kilometer per second and over 10 to the 5 years, you get a size of 10 parsec. But then how much of that momentum uh, is, is really staying in the cluster, and how much of that stays in the cloud, and how much is just lost to interstellar space? This is a really important question. Um, and so what the observations show is that first, uh, the momentum balance is what counts. So uh, a lot of people are doing energetic comparisons, but the only thing that's conserved is momentum. So that's what you want to look at. And when you count momentum in all the outflows, uh, and you also you find that uh, in Perseus, for example, in each cloud in Perseus, in, in each subregion in Perseus, uh, you already have a momentum rate that is close to the turbulent momentum dissipation rate. Uh, and there's a large contribution from fossil shells that have been identified, for example, by Quillen et al., uh, from 3D data cubes. These are hard to find if you just make normal maps and you just look at wings, because they're moving at very low speed, so you want to do a 3D analysis to, tr to start to see these structures, and they have a lot of momentum. Um, so, I mean, it's possible that even these numbers are uh, underestimates of the true amount of momentum. And especially also you don't count how much of that was dissociated and is in atomic age that you're not probing with CO. So this is all saying that it, it could be very important. And the way it's, it's coupled to the cloud is both by prompt entrainment, and we've seen that jets pulse and precess, and so this is enhancing the cross-section of interaction. But what you really want to do is to, is, is to, to that this momentum eventually couples to the bulk supersonic flow. So you don't want just something that's moving at supersonic speeds. So it's been, you have two ways of doing that. The first one is to have just uh, the interaction with an existing turbulent flow. And uh, this is shown in the movie on the right. Oops. Uh, that is a simulation uh, of, of, of an airflow that is, you just put a turbulent pulse, and then you let the turbulence die out, but because of the outflow, the turbulence does not dissipate and is just re-energized as this uh, outflow 
drives the, drives the shell, and then the airflow turn, is turned off, and the shell kind of breaks down into, into vortices and re-energizes the turbulence. Uh, this is work by Cunningham et al. And the second way to, to do that, uh, to couple with turbulence, is actually to have the interaction of these shells that I showed you before. And these shells interact, and they create shear, and this, this uh, decays into turbulence. Actually, the slower the movements, the better it couples to turbulence. And there's been um, very nice simulations of that, detailed simulations of this interaction of fossil shells. Uh, in, and what the first result is that it's, it looks very different from Fourier driving when you look at the power spectrum in the simulations. So this is just pure purely dri Fourier driving, sorry, from large scale in red. This is what you get when you inject a lot of airflow cavities and they interact with each other. And you see both a knee appears and the slope changes. And the green is when you do both large-scale uh, uh, large uh, driving and outflows, and you still see the shape changes. So the question now is, can we test this observationally? Um, how can we see that? And so um, people who've tried to do that from observations have claimed that they don't see the evidence for small-scale small scale injection. Uh, they've used principal component analysis, and they've used power spectra. The problem with these analyses is that power PCA uh, can't pick up the airflow driving scale. When you apply that to a simulation data cube where you have put airflow driving, it just doesn't see it. So it's not the right diagnostic that you want to use. Uh, and the VCS power spectrum uh, has some, some problems, probably because of optical depth first, um, and also because um, the other, other possible, so this is the result of the PC, um, VCS power spectrum from Padoan. Uh, that is showing a slope. What you retrieve from that is a slope of minus two that uh, is different, is slightly different from, from what was predicted here. But notice that this was made with just one type of shells on a, on a specific scale. Now, if you have shells with different sizes and uh, different uh, momentum properties, maybe that is going to change the, the predicted slope. So that's something that still needs to be investigated. And let's not forget that also there's going to be feedback on cluster scales by these wide, very wide uh, outflows. So conclusions. Um, so jets and outflows are not just beautiful, they're really essential to understand our formation, and they could impact also planet formation uh, through disk irradiation or an, an MEG effects if we do have disk winds, uh, and we know there's magnetic field in, in disks to collimate jets. Uh, the jets have multiple components, clearly maybe three different contributions, and, and the, you really need detailed analysis and modeling and more detailed observations to disentangle what is doing what. But we know that we still need to confine these jets with a, a magnetic field in the disk, which is arguing that this contribution is probably present. And then laboratory astrophysics are uh, a new tool, and these are just the next step, but maybe I'll stop here and, and take questions. Thank you. Okay, so we have some uh, question time. So please. Ah, yes, Sandra. <coughs> Peter Wojtke from St. Andrews University. Um, you mentioned that uh, the disk winds could be very, in, very efficient in shielding the UV from the disk. From the uh, star, yeah, the shielding the disk from the star. Sources. Um, but I, well, I, I would say that this is not what we see in the UV because. I think from the UV observations, you, you see the source, and I think that, that I mean, if, if the AV would be 10, the, the source would be just not there. So, te so, so ten, 10 is for class one. Uh, so I don't know which type of objects you're talking about. You're talking about class two sources? Class two? Yeah, okay. So well, as I in, in, in your graph, I think you had, uh, so l l it, let me put it this way. So I, I, I think in this case, if that's true, what, what you suggest, then the inclination should be a, an important parameter to the UV observations. Absolutely. But mm. I think that's not the case. But maybe uh, other p uh, experts mm -hmm. in, the, in the audience can, or, or you can, can comment on that. Uh, yes, yeah, so, um, yes, I, I, I should have said that this was quite an extreme class two that I showed. Uh, it's ten t it was for 10 to the minus seven uh, here. 
so this is for 10 to the minus 7 solar masses per year, which is quite high for a class 2 object. This was more like something like Digital. If you take 10 to the minus 8, you're already down here. So uh, that's just one AV. It's, it's still important for the UV. But uh, if you're looking it down from here, you would see the star. And in fact, something I forgot to mention is that uh, Manuel Goodall has looked at extinctions from, from X-rays uh, to stars. And often, they exceed uh, what you get from, uh, from um, previous estimates. So um, this, is, this is something, some, uh, something that you needs to be looked at, but this is Come on, how should I say this? When you look at it from above, from outside, there is very little chance that you're going to look through the disk. Okay? But for the disk itself, it really matters. That's just my point. That if, if you look at the star from outside, of course, the chances are that you're just going to look through this part and, it's, and you're going to see the star. But if, if you look at what happens in the disk, which was my point, it's, it's very different. That's what I should say. Chris. Left hand side. Uh, oops. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I should have left my time. Hi, so my name is Andrei Jean from MIT. Um, this might be a naive question, but can the outflows change the relative abundances of elements in the disk and as a consequence influence the elemental abundances of the, of the planets itself? So in other words, did someone check whether the elemental abundances in the outflow are the same as the elemental abundances in the disk? Ooh. Uh, no, I don't think we've checked that because when we see, the, for example, when we see gas, we can only measure what's in the gas phase for the moment. Mm -hmm. So we see depletion, but we think it's depletion on dust grains, but we can't measure how much is in the dust grains. So okay, right so now, that's kind of a sink for the for the dust for the silicates. Yes, the so. that's the way. At least that's the way we understand it because it seems to that that we recover everything further out, at least in the. And what about the volatiles? The volatiles. Uh -huh, like water, CO2. Yeah. So CO. The, the, the water, the water um, spectra that I showed you, mm -hmm. are reproduced uh, assuming that we had a water abundance in the ices of 10 to the minus four. So okay. everything we just assume that all the grains are lifted up. Right now, this is something that it's very simple models. Mm -hmm. It's just something that is starting. Mm -hmm. But it's true that jet chemistry is something very important that is is a developing field, and we have to mm -hmm. to look at that in more detail. Yes, uh, Chris McKee, Berkeley. Um, so, Sylvia, as you emphasize, the, the momentum in these jets is a very important parameter. And for theoretical modeling, a key number to know is what is the average uh, momentum per unit mass of stars formed. When Chris Matzner and I made our uh, model, you know, a decade ago, we just adopted a number which I think agreed with the observation at that point, which was 40 kilometers per second. Um, you then mentioned the subsequent observations by Quillen et al. And they had these little tiny fossil shells, and I think the corresponding number is like one or two kilometers per second. So my question is now, with current data, can you give us what is sort of for uh, the average for uh, stars, uh, for the protostars that are I cannot give you a number right from the top of my head. <laughs> but uh, I think this has to be, yeah, this may have to be revisited. Because a lot of the, um, the, the faster material is actually the one that's going to get out of the cloud. So, yeah. Right. So anyway, it'd be very helpful in your review if you yes, could do that. Yes, that's right. Good point. Left hand side, please. Peter Schirke, Cologne. Can you comment a little bit on the uh, dependence of the outflow, outflow properties on the mass? Ah, OK. Well, um, what, what do you mean by outflow? So the CO cavities or the jets? Both. Both? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm afraid. Well, the only thing, we're lacking statistics, I think, for the jets. I mean, we know that there are jets from massive stars and massive protostars, but there are only a few of them known right now. And I think ALMA, this is something that ALMA is really going to help us a lot about, because all the massive objects are further out. So I think it's too early for me to comment on that. We, we want to have the ALMA results first. Yeah. Uh, Johnson, Johnson Tan, Florida. Hi. Um, in your introduction, you mentioned the upper limit was about 10 solar masses for, for jets now. Well, roughly, yes. But I wanted to point out a paper by my student, Yi Chen Zhang, uh, where we looked at G35.2, and there's, there's definitely an ionized uh, jet there, and our estimates for the mass range from 20 to 35 solar masses wow. or so. Wow, great. So just to let you know about Fantastic. that. Fantastic, yes. Well, you have to give me the reference. We definitely want to update that. Okay, yeah. 
Kong from Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. And uh, I would like to comment a bit on the interaction between the wind from the protostar and, and the envelope because I checked the uh, reviews from the last protostar and planet conference and there's one review about all the outflow models and there's another review about the turbulence in the molecular cloud and I was very surprised to see this data connection be between the two and people now know that the outflows is going to drive turbulence in the molecular cloud and um, I think we should turn the argument around and to study how does the turbulence in the molecular cloud change the behavior of the jet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comment. Okay, center, please. from Nice. You said that the variation in the direction of the jet was tracking precession of the disk. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if the stellar spin axis should precess as well in this case or not. I'm asking this because of this paper by Batigin last year who said that protoplanetary disk could process while the stellar spin axis stays in place and this could produce misaligned uh, exoplanets, which ah. is important that they have been observed. Okay. So is this an observational um, proof of the Batigin mechanism or is it different? Um, yeah, what you say is very interesting. Um, I, I, I should have been more cautious in my phrasing. We see that the jet processes since we still don't know if the jets come predominantly from the star or from the, I mean, I think there is a big contribution from the disk, but depending on whether it's from the disk or the star, um, you could interpret this as disk axis precession or stellar axis precession. Um, so I guess, I guess the answer, uh, I mean, we need to know better the origin of the jet to, to, to answer your question. Uh, when we compared uh, to the models of disk precession to compare with the scales in HH111, I mean, I didn't do this, but uh, the authors did it. They compared to, to disk axis precession by a companion. But uh, yeah, no, that's a very interesting point. I wasn't aware of the possibility of... Uh, okay. yeah, although the time is limited, I will take three more questions, and uh, including the one upstairs. Mm -hmm. So, okay, sorry, left hand side, please. Okay, Ralph Klesson, Heidelberg. I feel I need to say a bit about uh, the defense of PCAs. I think the principal component analysis does indeed pick up scales and properties of the turbulence. I think it's more a question of which tracer you're using. So if you look at, um, say, turbulence with chemistry and you look at the CO emission maps, they pick up different slopes than what the overall velocity is doing. That is worked by Eric Bertram that has been submitted recently. And if you do that for tracers, um, so for dust, you again can get very different things in many statistical measures. So I think it's, it's, it's more a question of what you're looking at. I guess here the point was if you applied it to data cubes from simulations, that so no, ju just a simple tracer, uh, I guess a, an assuming an optically thin tracer, and you apply this to, to data simulations, you just don't recover. Uh, it just looks like it's large-scale driving, although you know that you've put in small scale. I think that was the main point. But you're, uh, I, I'm sure that tracers also matter. I think we have a slightly different experience in that. So. Really? OK. Well, I'm not the expert anyway, so <laughs> Adam is. So maybe you want to talk to Adam about that. Yeah. So upstairs. Uh, I read uh, times ago in a paper that uh, in uh, the case of Herbigara 174 has been detected for the first time the shocks diamond uh, in the jet. And it uh, seems that this was uh, the only case uh, known. The what? The, the shocks diamond, the uh, MAC disks. Ah, the, the, the MAC disk. Okay. Yes, but uh, pretty close to the base of the jet. So don't, uh, I mean, uh, not something connected with interaction of uh, uh, ah. subsequent bow shocks or things like that. Do you know if uh, this kind of phenomena is uh, frequent, has been detected also in other uh, uh, jets? Um, well, uh, again, this one, is, this time it's manual, the expert, but I think there's, there are several stars that do show a soft X-ray emission very close to the star. It's not, it's not spatially resolved uh, in a lot of stars, but uh, if, if this is indeed tracing kind of mag disks or recall emission shocks, then it means it's present in a fraction of stars. I, I, I'm not knowledgeable enough about X-rays to tell you, you know, if we can make statistics. It's, it, mm. Downstairs. Uh, Kai Tai, uh, Truman College. Uh, my question is about uh, the range of Reynolds number comparison between uh, lab uh, jets produced in 
labs and uh, uh, simulations and uh, in uh, the real protostellar jets. Um, remember, there were some uh, issues. There were some issues a few years back that uh, some mismatches, but I'm not sure the current status. Uh, okay, well, that's a technical question. Uh, um, yeah, I can't answer to that question. Um, uh, Andrea Charlie is in the room, so I, I hope that he can answer for me. <laughs> or he's not in the room. Um, Theo? I mean, definitely it's better in the experiments, it's much better than in the simulations. Oh, okay. And yeah, that, that's one of the, the main, one of the big interests of, of, of uh, experiments, sorry but it's still lower than in uh, astrophysical space, of course. Yeah. Upstairs, okay? Yeah. Okay, so I think that's it for the question. And let's thank the speaker again.